Good song. Good song. Thank you, Sister Jennifer. Thank you so much. Good song. Good to be here tonight. Good to see all of you here tonight. I trust you've had a good day. And I thank God for his blessing watching over us and taking care of us and allowing us this time in his house tonight. Amen. Been a beautiful day out there. I hadn't been out in it much. Been in this word today, but I'm thankful for all of God's blessings. Amen. He's been good to us, hasn't he? He really has. We have so much to praise him for and thank him for. And we want to do that tonight. And, of course, share some time to prayer tonight at the end of our service. We'll take some prayer requests and pray. And remember those that are not here. And ask the Lord to help them. Continue to remember. Uh, pray for them. And uh, ask the Lord to strengthen those that want to be here and are not able. Thank the Lord uh, for his answers to prayer. And uh, I'm thankful he's still on the throne. He still hears and answers prayer and knows what we stand in need of. We're going to look into the word of God. Of course, you know the announcement we have planned. Amen. Let's pray together and ask the Lord to help us. And then we'll look into his word tonight. Father, we are indeed grateful and thankful. For all your many blessings, Lord, you have blessed us with so much. Grace, love, mercy. Lord, uh, that's just the start of what you've done for us with your salvation. And Lord, uh, you brought us into your family, letting us be one of your own children. What a joy it is to know you and the free pardon of sin. And Lord, to know that we are one of yours. You have changed us by your power and by your might. And you are conforming us to the image of your own dear son. We praise you, Lord, for that. We ask you now, Lord, that you would touch in our midst tonight. Thank you, Lord, for each one who's here, this good number. We praise you, Lord, for them. And ask you, Lord, that you'd speak to our hearts tonight as we open your word. What a joy and a privilege it is to meet together collectively and open your word together and watch as you, Lord, bring it alive to our hearts and to our minds and to our souls and spirits. And, Lord, to watch you do what only you can do, teach us and show us the things from your word and encourage our hearts. And give us strength and, Lord, give us a, a, a ability to stand on your word and know you're still in control. Thank you, Lord, for what you have prepared for us tonight. Help us, Lord, to receive it and to use it for your glory. And it conform us to the image of your dear Son. And we'll praise you for all that you do in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, open them to the book of James. James chapter number 5. James chapter number 5. Tonight, we're going to be in James chapter number 5. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. Last week we were in the first part of this chapter, Biblical Wisdom for Money and Possessions. We looked at the first six verses in this chapter, and we talked about what James has to tell us concerning uh, our possessions and uh, concerning how to have wisdom and handling what God has given us. He said not to be selfish, do not be selfish, do not be dishonest he said there in verse number four and then he said do not be self-indulgent in verse number five and then he talked about be not to do not be manipulative in verse number six tonight we'll pick up with verse number seven and we'll look down through verse number 12 and look at this next section of what he's writing concerning the saints who are scattered abroad. That's how this whole book opens. And of course, he's writing to you and I as those saints. He's talking about the children of Israel, of course. He's talking to Jews, but he's talking to us who know the Lord as our Savior. And so I want to begin reading with verse number 7 tonight. If you're able and can, we'll stand and read these verses and look at them for just a few moments tonight. And talk about what the Lord is showing us here in these verses. And of course it deals with the first phrase of verse number 7. Be patient therefore brethren unto the coming of the Lord. Behold the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth. 
and hath long patience for it until he receive the earthly rain, the early and latter rain, the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Now look at verse 10. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay nay, lest you fall into condemnation. I'm leaving off reading there with verse number 12. You can be seated. I will look at tonight the art of patience. The art of patience. I guess that's something we all need uh, I guess a little help with from time to time is the art of patience. I'm not always a very patient man. Uh, Sister Karen is just dealing with some allergies and she stepped out and started coughing there. That's probably uh, the Lord helping me. So she don't say amen too loud and, and disrupt the surface, uh, service in the middle of this lesson on patience. Someone has said, my pastor used to say patience is the, the ability to run idle. He's talking man terms. So we know about man terms, uh, racing and uh, those hot rod cars. I used to have one. He said, my, pa my pastor used to say, patience is the ability to let your motor run idle when you're dying to strip your gears. I thought that was real good. I was looking at another definition today of patience, and it said the ability to stay put and stand fast when you'd like to run. I thought that was real good. Because in reality, that's, uh, that's true. We often want to run, run away from things. Run, run, run. Patience uh, means that you don't run from them you remain steady. You remain standing. Sometimes you want to run from these things. Much of our lives is spent waiting. Someone said, if you take the entire life of a person, an average person that lives wherever in a metropolitan area or wherever we live, he'll spend six months of his life, six months of his life, sitting at a red light. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, depends on what environment you live in. We spend a lot of time waiting, don't we? Much of our time is spent in waiting. Sometimes we face situations we'd like to go faster, so we want to try to run ahead. And patience doesn't run ahead of God. We wait on God, so we need to learn to understand what James is saying here. He uses two different words here for patience, patience and perseverance. And they deal with the same object in mind, I guess, or the same thought in mind of learning to wait or learning to have the same ability to understand and have the difficulty or have the understanding to endure, to have in control the things concerning our lives of understanding God has them in control. Proverbs, I told you. James was a student of Proverbs. He was a student of Solomon, I think, in the writings of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 16, verse number 32. Look at this verse. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. That's a pretty, pretty, uh, pretty big statement there that Solomon is making. He said, a man that can control his spirit, ruleth his spirit, is mightier than he that taketh the city. A 
man that's in control. He's got patience. So we learn about patience tonight. We're going to learn the art of patience. I was reading and studying and listening and doing a lot of things this week and preparing for James chapter 5 verse 7 through verse 12. And I ran across a test on patience. Uh, you want to take the test on patience? Why don't you take this test on patience? Just four quick questions. You'll number them from one to ten, and uh, you'll score them, of course. On uh, ten, of course, meaning you uh, you handle it well, you do good, and uh, one meaning you know you don't you don't do real good in that area. You have problems in that area, and uh, see how well you score. Okay, just four simple questions. We'll see how good you are in patience. All right? Let's see how well we do. Number one, how well do you handle interruptions in your life? How well do you handle interruptions? Now, before you score yourself, let me explain it to you. You've just sat down for dinner and suddenly the phone rings. How do you, how do you handle that? How do you take that? You just sit down, the phone rings or, rings, or maybe you've just about to step into the bathtub or the shower and the doorbell rings. Or uh, something else interrupts your daily routine. You've got it planned out and somebody calls and they've just interrupted everything you've got planned. How do you, how do you deal with that? How do you, well, do you handle that interruption? I've learned in ministry, of course, that has happened. I can't count the times. I used to have different people. Me and Carrie, we used to laugh. We really did. We learned, turned it into a laughing session because it never failed. We could eat at 6, we could eat at 7, we could eat at 8, or we could eat even at 9, Brother Mick, and the phone always rung. It's amazing. We used to laugh about it. She said, I don't care what time I fix dinner, the phone's going to ring. And I said, it's okay, baby. It's not an interruption. These are a, a blessing. These people are a blessing. Now, these are blessed interruptions. What are you talking about? This is what I live for. She knows that. She understands that. And, of course, the Lord Jesus handled those interruptions. You remember on one occasion... Those disciples were around him like secret service men around the president. And, of course, uh, some people came with their children wanting him to bless their children. Bless our little children. He said, oh, no, 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 Lord, can't see your children today. And he said, oh, no, 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 suffer, suffer them to come and forbid them not allow those kids to come. Wait a minute. He handled those interruptions well. How well do you handle interruptions? Now, uh, score yourself. Ten meaning you handle them, you handle them just fine. That uh, don't bother me a bit. And uh, one means that you have a lot of problem with interruptions. So score yourself between one and ten. Here's number two. How well do you handle inconveniences? Inconveniences. How well do you handle them? I mean... Uh, you, so you come in and somebody just sat down in your pew where you always sit. Hmm. Hmm. Somebody's got my seat. Hmm. I pulled in the parking place and somebody knows where I park. Hmm. Hmm. You go to get a parking place and somebody pulls right in front of you. You've been waiting trying to get that parking place, trying to get a parking place. Somebody pulls right in front of you. How well do you handle that, huh? We live in a microwave age. Ten means you handle it well. I mean, you never get upset. Don't bother you a bit. One means I don't handle that very well. Mm -hmm. You have to go through a detour. You get up there in town and suddenly they've got Highway 27 US 1 closed at the crossing there at Highland Avenue. How well do you handle that? You start upset and turn around there at AutoZone and Brother Frank's in there working and he looks up and sees you cussing. Oh, my. No. Well, how well do you handle it? Do you handle it with ease and say, well, I could, I'd could, always go a different way? How well do you handle it? Hmm? It's amazing, ain't it? Uh, we live in a minute, uh, second, I should say, generation. 
Americans hate delays. We got a microwave mentality. Somebody said, I believe that's true. Instant grits, instamatic cameras. We want everything now, information now. We want everything. Click, click, click. I love the uh, Russian, uh, the Russian humorist, uh, comedian that come to America. He said the first time he went to a grocery store here in America, he thought it was absolutely amazing. He's walking into the produce section and turns and goes down the aisle. And he comes on over to the frozen fruit food section. He says, look, instant orange juice. So what is that? He asked someone. They saw us. He saw the oranges over in the produce section. He said, but what is this? He said, oh, it's instant orange juice. Add a little water and poop. It becomes orange juice. That's amazing. He walked down another aisle and there on the shelf was instant milk, powdered milk. He said, now what is this? They explained to him, you just add a little water to it and it becomes milk. He said, wow, that's amazing. Walked on over to another, instant potatoes. He said, what is this? Powdered potatoes. You add a little water to it, poof, they become instant potatoes. Potatoes. Dehydrated, you add a little water to him. He said he walked on over to the health and beauty section and said, there it was. He said he'd never seen anything like it. Baby powder. <laughs> well, we're not quite that quick, are we? But it's amazing how fast things go. As I was reading this, I thought it was very humorous as well. A hundred years ago, we missed a stagecoach. We said, well, no problem. Another one will be by in a day or two. Years ago, we missed a train, and we said, no problem. Another one will be by in a few hours. Today, in our culture, we miss one revolution on the revolving door, and we're upset. We're already behind. Oh, my. Or the elevator. Push the button. It's not coming fast. You ever stood there and watched people? I go to the elevators a lot, you know, when I go to the hospitals. Now, I ride them up. I don't ride them down normally. I take the stairs coming down, but it makes it healthier for me. I feel better about myself. I don't know how much better it is, but I do feel better about myself. But uh, I've noticed that people stand there, and if they don't come, some people, not everybody, but some people, it's absolutely amazing, Tim. It really is. They'll stand there, and they'll look at the buttons, look at the elevators, wait on them. And if they're not going fast enough, even the button is still lit up, they'll push it again and push it again and push it again. And I'm thinking, I don't think that's helping anything, <laughs> but uh, help yourself. That makes you feel better. We were coming back from the uh, seniors trip shopping the other day, running to a uh, traffic uh, wreck on the highway, it had traffic blocked. Everything had stopped. And uh, I, I know sometimes people are, are really in a, in a dire situation. And I know what happens. And I was watching as we were sitting there. We were just waiting. It was amazing how many people began to turn around, turn around in the middle of the road to go back another way because they didn't have time to wait. We didn't have to wait very long at all till we got through. But it was amazing. The lack of patience. Score yourself how well you handle Handle uh, those uh, inconveniences. Here's the third one. Ready? Zero to ten or one to ten. How well did you do? How well do you handle irritations? Now, what's irritation? Little things that bug you. Little things that bug you. Here's one that used to bug me. I used to tell the boys, don't eat up all the ice cream. Bring ice cream home. I loved ice cream. I'd bring ice cream home for them boys. And I'd go in there, and I'd buy them the flavors they wanted. I'd buy the flavor I liked. I'd go in there to check mine and Sister Ann and open that thing up. You deal with children. You know how it is. And, and Sister Becky, y'all deal with children. Sister Jennifer, y'all teach children. You open that thing up, and there'd be one little, I'm talking about this big around, right, right over there in the corner of the carton, one little, I bet it wasn't a tablespoon, Brother Mick. I bet it wasn't a tablespoon, Brother Ryan, of ice cream left, Brother Ken, for me to eat. And I say, who eat all? Why wouldn't no, I? There's some in there, Daddy. We'll have some. Or oh, ain't enough to put in a cup of ice cream left. 
The irritation, does that irritate you? Uh, when, the, when the printer won't print fast enough. Hmm? Does that irritate you? The computer won't reboot fast enough. Does that irritate you? What are those little irritations that bother you? And I read an interesting article on this. This was printed in a major newspaper years ago about a man that lived in uh, Provo, Utah. His name was Brian His Hensey. Brian Hensey. He describes his morning. He said he woke up one morning to water dripping in his house. His pipe had broke, burst and his apartment was flooded above him. It was dripping from the ceiling and it was beginning to flood his apartment. So he decided he would contact the manager. So he called him and the manager said, go rent a vacuum, a wet vac, and start vacuuming and we'll get that thing fixed. No problem. So he went out to wet a, rent a wet vac early that morning and said when he went out, his car had a flat tire. He went to get the car changed, and when he went back into his apartment, it was ankle deep in water by this time. He went to grab the phone to call a friend to come over and help him. And when he grabbed the phone, in standing in that water, it shocked him so bad, he jerked the phone out of the wall. It's back for cell phone. And uh, he left the apartment again, got his car, uh, he got the wheel fixed, but he went back to call a friend. Come back out, someone had stolen his car. He left it running, evidently, after he got the tire changed. Somebody had stolen his car. Luckily for him, he didn't have a whole lot of gas in it, so he found it just a couple of blocks from his house where he had run out of gas. So he pushed it on over and got some gas in it, filled it up. That evening, he had to attend a ceremony honoring someone, uh, one of the uh, uh, honorees for a military salute. And uh, he sat down at that uh, military salute, and a bayonet was in his chair, and he injured himself, requiring several stitches on the backside of his posture. The doctors were able to stitch up the wounds, and uh, he was able to go back home. When he got home, he found uh, something in the water there had happened in the floor. He slid and uh, on the wet carpet, injured his tailbone, tearing out the new stitches. And he went back to the hospital to be re-sewed up. And they asked him about his injuries. He said, I begin to wonder if God wanted me dead and just kept missing. <laughs> you have days like that? How well did you score on irritations? Here's the last one we were done with the test. How well do you handle inactivity? Inactivity. Are you the kind of person you just can't stand to not do anything? You got to be doing something. It just irritates you. I mean, if you go to the doctor for an appointment, it's at 10, and you have to sit there till 11, it's just going, boy, I'm telling you, he better have a good excuse. I just can't stand to sit here and wait. I'm telling you, something's got to happen. You're going crazy. I mean, you just can't wait. You can't wait for the traffic light to change. You can't, get, you can't stand to get behind some slow poke going down the highway, and, and you can't get around them. I mean, you just can't stand it. I mean, it's just a problem for you. you that kind of person. Now, they tell us that's the type A personality trait, and they tell us that people that have that type A personality trait usually have problems other than patients with their health. Uh, they develop problems. Uh, they can't wait. Can't wait for anything. How well did you score? How well did you score on that? I want to tell you, God has some answers for you. And uh, the answers are good to help you with patience. They really are. To help all of us with patience. Did you score good? Well, 40, you don't need to even hear my message tonight. If you scored 40, you can just go ahead and stand up. We'll salute you and go and hit the door and go on home. Because uh, you have more patience than any of us. Go ahead. But if you scored between 30 and 40, that means you might need a little help. 
And if you scored between 20 and 30, that means you probably need some help. And God has some help for us. You've scored below 20. Well, yeah, hang on. God's going to help us. I'm glad he's got something to help us. As I was reading that test from a uh, Christian man who helped develop that test, he, he, said, uh, he said four things you need to do, and I'll hasten to get those, and we'll run on through this. The Bible says, of course, you need a new perspective on life. I sense uh, several people's <laughs> Zig Ziglar's new perspective on life, a five-minute problem solver as he used to deal with people and try to help people. And, of course, that is learning and understanding what to be grateful for. But, but of course, with the Jesus as the center of our life, we need to learn to understand a new perspective and understand more people around us better. One of the things I've tried to learn in my life and my plans and my ambitions and my goals is to schedule uh, things with other people in mind. What do you mean by that, preacher? I mean, uh, don't be egocentric. My world don't evolve around me as much as it does around other people. Keep them in mind. If you want a better husband, then uh, husbands try to understand the way your wife looks at you. That's hard, I know. I try my best to see how does she, why is she not getting the way I feel? Why does she not understand what I'm trying to say? Why is she not, how am I not communicating? Wives, if you uh, want to be more effective in understanding things to your husbands, try to see it from his perspective. Try to look through his eyes. Same thing true with other people you deal with. When's the last time you dealt with a person that had a problem and you stopped for a moment and asked that question in your mind? I wonder what's making them act this way. I wonder why they feel this way. I wonder why they're doing what they're doing. Why? And of course, they learn that in business and it makes them billion dollar companies to learn how to treat their customers, how to deal with their customers. And, of course, that is the learning that new perspective, learning how to deal with their customers, learning what to do and how to do to help their customers. And, of course, then deepen your love. You need to deepen your love. Learn how to love people more. The Bible speaks of that. Learn how to de depend on the Lord. That's a big one, learning how to depend on the Lord. We all must need to do that, learn how to depend on him more in order for us to be successful in patience. And James here, he dives in to tell us and gives us three examples here of being patient. So I'm going to give them to you quickly. We're out of here. He says to have patience, we need to learn to wait with expectation. He talks about it here in verse number seven, be patient. That word patient means forbearing, long-suffering. And the idea there, of course, is to have the patience to wait, to have the long-suffering to forbear, to have the patience he talks about, of course, as a farmer or husbandman. That's a farmer. A farmer has learned that when he puts the seed in the ground, it's not going to come up tomorrow. It's a guarantee. But he also knows we got some farmers in our church. And I thank God for them. And boy, we got some wise ones. I'm telling you, we got some smart ones. I, they beat all I ever seen in my life. I mean, they, I, I can go see them, and uh, man, they've, they've given me stuff out of their garden and stuff out they've grown, uh, and boy, the stuff they've planted. And they can tell me now, preacher, uh, we'll have we'll have corn and so and so by so and so date on the calendar. We're gonna have tomatoes by so and so date on the calendar. And I'm thinking, man, how does he know that? He's been farming so long. He knows when he puts that seed or puts that plant in the ground, he knows with anticipation, with expectation, he's dependent on God to bring forth that rain. And, uh, of course, he'll call me sometime. I've had a couple of them call me at different times saying, I'm preaching we need some rain. You need to help me pray for rain. Or I'll go see them. they say, you, you need to help us pray for a little rain. Need a little shower now. Things are getting a little dry. Need a little shower, preacher, on this garden. 
And here James talks about it. Be patient. He patient. He talks about it here. Be patient. The Bible talks about us learning with expectation to be patient. Do you wait with patience? That is with earnest expectation. Now, earnest, of course, is looking for and waiting with patience, with an expectant. You think it with anticipation it's going to happen. He talks about the coming of the Lord. Just as real as we know the coming of the Lord is going to happen, he talks about a, a farmer waiting uh, for the crop, that precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it. He plows the field, he plants the seed, and then he patiently waits for the early and the latter rain. They put that seed in the ground, they'll wait on that rain. They'll wait on that rain to bring it forth up, bring the, the Lord to bring it forth. And he says, be ye also patient, establish your hearts. He talks about there in verse number 8. You know, the Bible talks about how we ought to be patient. I used to work with people in the jail, I used to have a jail ministry and used to work with inmates and try to help them, develop them. Some of them get saved, get their heart right, and some of them had some terrible things in their past. And, and some of them were so discouraged. Well, how they overcome their past, overcome the deeds of what they'd sold in their past. How do you overcome that? I said, well, you know, the old saying, you sow your wild oats and they're going to come up. Some people pray for a crop failure, but them wild oats still come up. You sow them. You do those things. And I take them to Galatians chapter 6, verse number 7. And the Bible says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Hmm. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And boy, they look at that and they think, Oh boy, man, I didn't want to hear that. Yeah, I said, That's what you're reaping right now. That's the reason you're in jail. You got out there and sowed. Wild oats, and, and now you're reaping it. You're reaping what's happening to you. I said, but don't stop there. You read that verse and we stop. Verse number 8 says, For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. That's what you're reaping. But the Bible says also in verse number 8, But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Oh, start reaping to the, start sowing to the Spirit, and you'll reap from the Spirit. Just as fervent as you was about sowing to the flesh and fulfilling the desires of the flesh, why don't you get that fervent and that desirous about pleasing God with your life? Giving it over to God, honoring God with your life. And then I said in verse number 9 says, And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season, due season, we'll reap if we faint not. Keep sowing those seeds, it'll come up. He says, the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. That word nigh means near. It's going to happen real soon. It's going to happen. Now, of course, it happens quicker than we want it to sometime. But thank God the Lord is coming. He is coming. Beloved, be not ignorant of one, this one thing, that a day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. We don't know about God's time. Amen. God's not concerned with time as much as we are. He's concerned with timing. That's God. He is timing. Here's the second thing. We have patience and relate gracefully. He talked about the farmer to wait patiently. Now he talks about having relations right, gracefully, relate to one another gracefully while we're waiting. Sometimes we get impatient. He's still talking about patience, the art of patience. How do we wait, preacher? He says it here in verse number 9. He said, grudge not one against another, brethren. Grudge not. That word grudge means to groan or sigh. You ever do that? Oh, me. God help me. No, God forgive me. Because we do it, don't we? That's a perfect example of impatience. Somebody says something, the first thing you do is, oh, me. Hmm. You're showing your impatience. You, you, you seen it? Huh? Huh? Hello? Huh? 
Example, you're in a store. Hey, can I get change for five? Okay. Hmm. Hey, could you give it? Yeah, I guess. Impatience. Huh? Maybe it's your loved one. Maybe it's your friend. Or maybe it's even your spouse. Or what? One against another, brethren. Refrain from grumbling. Now, Brother Ken brought this out Sunday night, so I won't have to dwell on this. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 14. Do all things without murmuring or disputing. Oh, my. He says, uh, don't grudge. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth at the door. Now, of course, he's being reminded of those, no doubt, those Israelites in Exodus chapter uh, excuse me, Numbers chapter 21 that uh, murmured against Moses when he's leading them across the wilderness. You remember what happened? And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. And they bit the people and much of the people of Israel died. Why? Because they murmured and complained against God. Now, God uses the prophets as an example of suffering and affliction and patience here in verse number 10. You notice what he says? Verse number 10, he talks about, Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering and of patience. Now, God calls his prophets in the Old Testament to preach to his people Israel. I started to bring you a list of them and how God used them. Isaiah, Nahum, Amos, Hosea, a lot of those Old Testament prophets, Jeremiah, God used them tremendously to preach to a nation that was wayward, backslidden. And, and yet those uh, prophets, man, I'm telling you, many of them, many of them never saw Jonah. Jonah preached to Nineveh and they repented. Nahum preached to Nineveh, I believe it was, and they didn't repent. Swift destruction happened. Hey, what, what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying... A lot of them didn't see, didn't see a nation turn back to God. They didn't see any fruit of what God was trying to get his people to do. But their patience was still the same. They still kept preaching. Got thrown in the pit. Got mocked at. Got scoffed at. Jeremiah walked in with that yoke around his neck and said there's a yoke of bondage coming up on Israel. We're going to be put in slavery. And another prophet took it off his neck and threw it down on the ground and said that's a lie. Mocked him. Of course that man died. Done that. But uh, Jeremiah just kept preaching. Just kept preaching. Just kept preaching. What are you saying? The patience. And Jeremiah didn't get mad. He didn't get upset. He didn't lash out. What do you say in Colossians chapter 4? It says, let your speech be, also, be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Gracious speech. Now, sometimes that's where we lose it. We lose our testimony for God, too. When they don't hear, and we are example in suffering. We have to be an example with salt. Salt preserved. You ever notice that? It's preserved. It prevents a conversation from going the wrong way. Turn that thing around. Here's the third thing. Have patience and persevere with what? How you persevere? Faithfulness. That's the example of Job. He persevered. Why? How? By just being faithful to God. He didn't understand everything that was happening to him. You've heard me preach on it the last so a couple of months. He, he didn't understand everything that was happening to him. He didn't know all these things. He didn't know he was being put to the test. But he said, I'm just going to believe God. I'm just going to trust God. Naked came out of this world. Naked shall I return. And all this, Job sinned not with his lips. He said, God's been good to me. God's never done me wrong. I don't believe God's going to do me wrong now. Is it not right for God to give and God to take away? Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm just going to keep praising God. God was good when everything was good. He's still good when everything's bad. He's still good. He's still God. That's what Job said. He said, my praise and my God is not dependent on whether or not things are going good or going bad. He's still God. That's the example here. 
Behold, we count them happy which endure. He said here in verse number 11, we count them happy. Consider happy. The word happy here indicates the God's approval on the behavior and knows His will. We understand His will. We understand we're in His will. You heard the patience of Job and seen the end of the Lord. He talks about how God rewarded Job, how God was with Job. Job chapter 42 and verse number 10, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Sure did, he blessed him. He blessed him. We want everything quick now, instantaneous. Everything in a hurry. Everything very comfortable. But God's, God's uh, plan sometime is for us to endure. And for the world to see us endure in, in suffering and to be patient. Tribulation worketh patience, the Bible says. And patience what? Experience. And experience hope. And hope maketh not a shame because the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. Experience. That proves our character. Experience does. Tribulation because it produces patience. Here's the last thing I'm done. We must with patience communicate honesty and honestly. He said, but above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, and your nay be nay, lest you fall into condemnation. Now in James' day, they had a very serious problem with oaths. And James is echoing the, actually the words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. That's the reason I said I believe he was there. Jesus said in verse number 34 of Matthew chapter 5, but above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath. Same words. That word swear means to affirm or denying by oath, saying uh, such things like, I swear to God. You hear people use that? But I swear to God. As a byword or a by phrase, you need to be careful about that. Huh? Well, I'd swear on a stack of Bibles. Careful about that. And that, of course, raises the question, should I, should I make an oath in the court? Now, they don't require you to put your hand on the Bible no more and swear in court anymore. I tell you, raise your hand, you swear or affirm is the words they use now. And, of course, that's really not what it's speaking of here. It's talking about in casual conversation. It's talking about like in uh, using the Lord's name in vain. Casually talking about swearing concerning the Lord. Taking an oath in court and giving a false testimony. Actually falls under Exodus chapter 20. What? Thou shalt not bear false witness. And of course you don't want to hear them. They won't use that in the court of law. But he says here, let you, let, yea be yea, you nay be nay, lest you fall into condemnation. What he's speaking of here is, he's talking about as we deal with people, what? Be honest in our conversations. Be patient with people. Be patient with people. Don't lose control in your conversation. Oh my, man, oh man, oh man. I have to confess here. I have to have a little time with the Lord this morning. Mm. Put away from thee a forward mouth and perverse lips put far from thee. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 24. What's he saying? He's talking about what? Don't lose your cool. You sometimes lose your testimony when you lose your cool. Oh my. Be patient with people. Be patient in your conversation. We all are subject to get angry, but what? Don't let the sun go down in your wrath. Be angry and what? Sin not. Somebody says, you, you, it's sin to get angry. No, it's not a sin to get angry. Just learn to control yourself when you get angry. Let, let the Holy Spirit of God control you. Be patient. The art of being patient. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you again for what you're teaching us here in the book of James. You're so good to us in so many ways. Lord, you help us. 
of so many things. I want to thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit that lives and abides within us, is teaching us and helping us and showing us. Lord, I thank you. I thank you that he is alive and well in me, convicting power of the Holy Spirit of God of what he does and what he can do. If we allow him to take control of us and be, uh, Lord, who we ought to be, who you want us to be, lights in a dark world, examples to others to point people to Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing, what you're going to do. We trust you for it. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.